Dr. Akpununu uh, earned his medical degree from the University of Toledo College of Medicine and completed his emergency medicine residency at the University of Kansas Hospital. He went on to complete a fellowship in medical toxicology at Oregon Health and uh, Science University in Portland. Currently, he is an assistant professor of emergency medicine at the University of Kentucky and is the medical director of the Kentucky Poison Control Center. In addition to his teaching and clinical responsibilities, he is interested in medical toxicology and further research opportunities to explore opioid use treatment options. Uh, Dr. Reagan Baum, uh, originally from Oregon, Dr. Baum received her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy and subsequently completed a pharmacy practice and emergency medicine specialty residency at the University of Kentucky Healthcare. Dr. Baum current responsibilities include providing comprehensive uh, pharmaceutical care to patients in the emergency department. She is also active in recepting pharmacy residents, pharmacy students, emergency medicine residents, and interdisciplinary students while on rotation in the emergency department. Areas of interest include toxicology, infectious disease, resuscitation, in teaching, Dr. Baum co-coordinates clinical toxicology and community, um, community emergency response team uh, elective in the PharmD curriculum and is a non-physician teaching faculty for the Department of Emergency Medicine. Uh, Dr. Jordan Kelch uh, received her Doctor of Pharmacy and Master of Public Health degrees from the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy and the College of Public Health. She completed uh, a pharmacy practice and emergency medicine residency at UK Healthcare, and she is currently an academic detailing pharmacist with the treatment team in the healing community study. So welcome uh, all, to all our speakers. And I believe I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kelsch uh, right now. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, good deal. All right, uh, we have no financial disclosures um, to, uh, to present. For our practice gap in educational needs, in recent years, there's been an increase in the use and subsequent harm from synthetic substances that are available in various head shops and online. We'll be covering a few of those listed here. And awareness of these substances and their effects is important to promote the health and safety for people who use drugs. Our learning objectives are to identify various substances available through head shops and online, to describe the clinical effects of these substances, and to discuss the availability and legality of the substances. Our expected outcomes, hopefully you will, will be able to recognize the concerns with the use of these substances and to integrate knowledge of the substances into caring for people who use drugs. So before we get started into specific topics, I think it's important to be familiar with the different patterns of use for persons who use opioids and have opioid use disorder. So nationally, we know a very low proportion of patients um, with a substance use disorder receive any type of treatment. And when you look at opioid use disorder specifically, only about one in five persons receive treatment and even fewer, one in 10 receive medication treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, we also know that polysubstance use is very common among persons who use opioids. And then a sample of the veteran population, they found that more than half had an opioid use disorder and at least one other substance use disorder, and more than 35% had opioid use disorder and at least two other substance use disorders. So we know it's very common. We also know that the substances that people are using have changed over time. So this graph shown here illustrates people who were in treatment for opioid use disorder from 1992 to 2017. And you can see that the prevalence of opioid use with cocaine or alcohol, which is shown in the top two lines has decreased over time, while opioid use with benzodiazepines or methamphetamine has, decre or has increased over time and that's shown in the bottom two lines. We also know that fewer people with an opioid use disorder who do use other substances, they're less likely to receive treatment. And importantly, it's common for more than one substance to be involved in an overdose death. The next slide. So this slide might be a tad busy and hard to read, but that is 
the, the hope that I was trying to convey here. So this is a screenshot from the 2020 Kentucky overdose fatality report. So here, these are the substances and their frequencies that were identified in toxicology reports from overdose deaths. So in the case of more than 1900 people who lost their lives to an overdose, you can see that there's very commonly more than one substance that is detected in toxicology testing. But what I think is also important is that we're probably missing a multitude of substances that are not being tested for in toxicology reporting. Next slide. And then when we talk about the opioid use disorder, there's also been this rise in novel psychoactive substances. So that term really means, um, it's used to describe substances that are either synthetic chemicals or derived from plant or fungal material. And they're often synthetically made to mimic those illicit substances that are commonly known, but they're structurally just slightly different and they're made to evade any kind of legal restriction. So often you'll see these substances advertised as legal highs or research chemicals, and they'll even be labeled as not for human consumption or specimens for microscopy. And that's really so they can escape any type of liability for harm that they may cause. So often these substances can be found in head shops, the internet, and different types of sources, but we really have very little data on their chemistry and purity and toxicology and their effects. And it's really hard to come up with data that's reliable when it's really hard to tell what's in a substance that someone is using. So I just have a picture here of a substance called mephedrin that was at one point advertised as a plant food, obviously intended for human consumption, and its structure is very similar to methamphetamine and similar compounds. Next slide. So although the title of this presentation is what's in a head shop, I think it's important to recognize that there's really a spectrum of sources that substances can be obtained from. And there's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of head shops that are moving online. And there's also the development of what's called a crypto market. So this, there's very little data about exactly um, the impacts of a crypto market, but it's really where anonymous buyers can use cryptocurrency to buy thousands of different substances. So we've talked about how poly substance use is common among people with opioid use disorder. So now we'll talk a little bit about the substances themselves. The next slide. So first we'll start with vaping. So this is probably one of the most common head shop findings, um, an e-cigarette or vape device product. So I wanna acknowledge that when I talk about e-cigarettes and vape devices, I'm not going to focus on comparing the tobacco products and these specifically to a traditional combustible cigarette, although that's a very important topic. Um, that in itself would take a whole lot of time. So for the focus of this presentation, I'm gonna focus on the devices themselves and the non-tobacco substances that can be used in them. So at a basic level, a e-cigarette or vape device heats a substance into an aerosol that's then inhaled. So even though they're referred to as vapes, they don't actually produce a vapor, it's an aerosol. And they're often widely advertised as being a safer alternative to cigarettes. Um, but what we'll discuss, they do have adverse effects that are important to be aware of. And there's really thousands of different devices that are on the market. And you can see here, they range from products that look like a traditional combustible cigarette to things that are very discreet and look nothing like a cigarette. Next slide. Um, it's also important to know that there are hundreds or thousands of different substances that can be used in these e-cigarette and vape devices. And it's just as important um, what they're putting in the devices and how the different substances can interact and the effects that you can see from that. There's often discrepancies in how the product and substance is labeled and what is actually contained in the purity and potency of what is actually contained in that product. So the most common substance that you'll find is an e-liquid. So obviously most commonly that contains nicotine. Um, the nicotine that's used in e-cigarette and vape devices contains a different type of nicotine than um, is found in traditional cigarettes. And that's so there can be a higher potency that will cause less airway irritation compared to a traditional cigarette. 
Um, E-liquids can also contain other substances such as THC, CBD, a variety of different flavoring agents, and then different combinations of humectants or solvents. And those are different substances that can be manipulated in different ratios uh, to help the person using the vape create the experience that they want to. So you can really manipulate lots of things about the experience by the ratios of the substances that are being used. Marijuana is also a substance that's frequently used in vape products, both legally and illegally, and it can be used in various different forms. So most commonly you may find THC concentrates and that can be um, in waxes or shatters that are similar to an oil. And then persons can use a wide variety of substances um, outside of those. So things like methamphetamine and synthetic cannabinoids. And there's also a variety of substances that um, are unknown that are being used in the devices. Next slide. So now I wanna highlight that how someone is using their device can be just as important as the substances that they are putting in the device. So at a basic level, most of the later generation e-cigarette and vape devices have a battery, a heating coil, and a cartridge where the substance can be um, placed. So traditional vaping, um, you heat that substance on the heating element into an aerosol, um, you can also place it directly onto the heating coil, and that's called dabbing or dripping, and that's most commonly used with uh, concentrated THC products. But someone can also alter the voltage and the resistance of the heating element, so that can create a completely different experience um, using this substance as well. So it's important to note when these devices are manipulated from their intended manufactured um, way to be used, that can also predispose someone to adverse effects. All right, some notable adverse effects of e-cigarettes and vape devices. So the FDA had received multiple reports of burns and seizure events um, from people who use vape and e-cigarette devices. And so that led the FDA to recommend to not store the devices in your pocket don't store them with other metal objects and don't use them if they have become wet. And they also reported or received reports of people who had experienced seizures. The etiology is not yet clear on what that might be from, but it's thought the uh, metal that's heated to high, high temperatures could be contributing to that. We've also seen toxic ingestions in adolescent and pediatric patients. So the e-liquids that are marketed to look exactly like candy or food products is really enticing for small adolescents. And in some poison control center data, they found that in 2010, there were 13 exposures to e-cigarette or vape device um, e-liquids in patients less than five, and that increased to over 1,800 in the year 2018. And then E-Valley has become one of the most well-known adverse effects of using an e-cigarette or vape device. So what is E-Valley? It stands for e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury. So it's a type of respiratory disease that can progress from hypoxemia to respiratory failure and even death. I mean, the data that we do have surrounding E-Valley is very recent within the last few years and from a lot of animal and laboratory modeling. Um, so it's important that we recognize this um, was the cause of an outbreak over the last few years. And the symptoms you can see associated with e -Valley are most commonly obviously respiratory. So things like cough, chest pain, shortness of air. Those symptoms were seen in more than 95% of patients diagnosed with e -Valley. Also common were gastrointestinal symptoms, so things like abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And when the CDC received reports of it, these um, types of presentations, they created a case definition to try to track these cases. So you can see I've listed here the criteria that's used to diagnose someone with E-Valley, and that's use of an e-cigarette device in the past 90 days, pulmonary infiltrates on imaging, and basically excluding any type of other diagnosis that may be contributing to the patient's presentation and symptoms. So we really don't have a lot of information even to this day about the true underlying pathophysiology of the disease. And we do have bronchoscopy results from patients that were diagnosed with e -Valley, 
but they're not entirely conclusive. So it's really hard to say exactly what the process is. Management of e Valley is mostly supportive care, but most patients do require hospitalization, intubation, and in some cases, ECMO support. There is even a case of um, a patient requiring a lung transplant after a diagnosis of e Valley. There are reports of using corticosteroids for treatment of e Valley, but there's not a lot of data. It's, um, there's a lot of variation in the doses and durations that were used for treatment. So to cover the epidemiology of e Valley, the identification of the outbreak started in July of 2019. There is a hot children's hospital in Wisconsin that were treating five um, adolescent patients with this mysterious pulmonary illness. And they notified the public health department who also was contacted by a physician in Illinois who was seeing similar patients present um, in that state. So they notified the CDC and they began an outbreak investigation. So here you can see the CDC has only been tracking hospitalized cases of E-Valley, but um, as of February 18th of 2020, I think with COVID, they um, stopped counting cases of E-Valley, but there are over 2,800 cases um, of hospitalized patients and 68 deaths. And this is just showing that um, E-Valley does happen in Kentucky as well. There were uh, multiple reported cases of E-Valley in Kentucky, and then the Kentucky Health Department released a statement to providers across the state in 2019, notifying them that this was something that should be on the differential for patients that were presenting with um, the symptoms of E-Valley. So here, I just want to highlight that there's a lot of variable findings and there's no clear answer for what's causing E-Valley. Um, there's a lot of chemicals that are produced when someone uses an e-cigarette or vape device. And so some of those chemicals I've listed here they have been either evaluated from patients where they've obtained samples from, either their products or their lung samples. And some of these are known to be toxic, but a lot that were identified, it's unknown what those effects in the body are. So one of the most prominent or prominent chemicals that they identified is vitamin E acetate. So that is thought to be the leading substance causing E. valley. Um, we don't really know exactly how it causes lung injury, because it's generally well tolerated um, orally or used topically, so its interactions in the pulmonary system aren't entirely clear. But the way they, the CDC identified this is they obtained lung biopsy samples from patients that were diagnosed with e Valley, and they coupled that with the products that they were able to obtain from patients who still had their products. And they found vitamin E acetate in almost every single one of them, not all of them. So that's why there's still a question if there's other substances that could be contributing to this. Um, but upon further interviewing, a lot of these patients identified that they had either self-reported using THC or THC was detected in urine drug screens. And they often reported to obtaining their vape device from an unofficial source. So either off market, from their friends, um, online, things of that nature. So it's thought that vitamin E acetate was included in the THC oils in order to dilute it and make the product go further. So in conclusions um, about vaping, it's really hard to conduct research on e-cigarette vape device products and the substances that are used in them, just for the fact that there are thousands of different products and different combinations that they can be used in. And there's also manipulations that the person using the device can make that makes it really hard to say exactly what's going on. So always use caution when using or purchasing black market products or obtaining them from informal sources. We'll move along to Kratom. All right, so Kratom changing gears a little bit is derived from a plant that originates in Southeast Asia. Traditionally, the leaves were used um, either chewed or brewed in tea, but now Kratom can be found in multiple different formulations, um, either ingested by smoking or ingesting a powder in a capsule form. So in the United States, it's largely unregulated and it's sold and marketed as a food or dietary supplement. The use of Kratom has become increasingly common in the United States over the past decade and primarily for the self-management of pain and opioid use disorder. 
Um, so as we've discussed previously, there are many patients who do not receive treatment for their substance use disorder in the United States. And it can be um, thought that leading to other the use of other substances to self-manage their symptoms is a result of a decreased access to care. So in a sample of 500 um, people with a substance use disorder actually done in Kentucky, they found that one out of five people did report using Kratom and they reported primarily using it to either discontinue or reduce the use of illicit opioids or for pain relief. I also know that Kratom is reported to improve social functioning and because Kratom is not routinely detected in urine drug screens, often people may transition to using Kratom for a period of time in order to obtain a negative screen. So Kratom is a very complex substance. So it's made up of over 40 different alkaloids. So two of the prominent psychoactive alkaloids that you may hear commonly are metragenine and 7-hydroxymetragenine. So these two alkaloids are agonists of the mu opioid receptor, although these compounds themselves are structurally different than a typical opioid. It's thought that they also have activity on, a, on the delta opioid receptor as well. So metragenine is thought to interact with the opioid receptor also in a different way using different signaling pathways than a traditional opioid compound would. It's proposed that this may explain the anecdotal reports of decreased respiratory depression seen with Kratom, um, but there's not great data for that. So 7-hydroxymetragenine makes up a smaller a proportion of naturally occurring Kratom, but it is much more potent. And so you can see it makes up in naturally occurring Kratom about 2% of the um, plant. It's also known that Kratom can interact with the CYP450 system, which is an important enzymatic pathway to metabolize different drugs. So it's unclear exactly how it interacts, but it's thought that that could cause some interaction when Kratom is used with other substances. So this slide is a little busy, but I think it does a good job to highlight the different effects that Kratom can have in the body through the different proposed mechanisms of action. So you can see some of its alpha-2 agonist effects. That's how it's thought to reduce some opioid withdrawal symptoms. And then one that I did want to point out in laboratory studies, it was found that Kratom does block potassium channels. So that can cause an increased risk of a an arrhythmia called torsades, which can be very dangerous. And then when we talk about Kratom, it's also important to keep in mind that when Kratom is studied, it's mostly been performed in lab and animal models. So we can't always uh, you know, say what that's going to do in a human, that's very low level data. And then when Kratom is studied, the alkaloids are usually studied individually. So when you consume the natural Kratom product, you're consuming multiple different alkaloids at the same time. So what are the clinical effects of Kratom? So it's often promoted as a, cell, uh, as a safer alternative to opioid use disorder treatment, but there's very little data, as I've mentioned, to support that claim. So reported effects from people who use Kratom say that it provides pain relief, improved mood, increased stimulatory effects, but there are also adverse effects that are often reported, and those include things like dehydration, lethargy, can also cause seizures, altered mental status. And it's thought that some of these effects may be dose related. So it's reported at a dose of one to five grams. Kratom can have similar stimulatory effects to caffeine. And then at moderate effects, it can act like an opioid. And then at high doses greater than 15 grams, it has um, very, very sedating effects. So Kratom itself has been associated with withdrawal symptoms, things like nausea, vomiting, um, anxiety, and constipation. And there are reports of death, deaths that involve uh, the use of Kratom. So these deaths are reported largely through poison control center data and they often involved other substances that were used, so it's really hard to say exactly what role uh, Kratom played. As far as testing, since it is structurally different than a typical opioid, it's not generally detected on urine drug screens. It can be detected through confirmatory testing, but often that requires a send out 
Um, so at UK Healthcare, it is a send out lab uh, to confirm the presence. So this is some poison control center data over the time period of 2011 to 2017. So they reported a total of over 1800 exposures during this time period, but the exposures increased over 50 fold from 2011 to 2017. And 65% of the total exposures actually occurred in the last two years of the study period. The majority um, did uh, the majority of effects that were reported include agitation, drowsiness, tachycardia, and seizures. And there were notably respiratory issues that were reported, including respiratory depression. In 2017, the FDA did receive reports of 44 deaths that were related to Kratom. Often these deaths involved other substances like benzodiazepines, alcohol, and other opioids. So again, it's very difficult um, to say exactly what the additive effects of these substances are. All right, one of the main concerns with Kratom is that there's really a lack of oversight in the safety and manufacturing of Kratom products. So specifically, there's been concerns with contamination and, adul and adulteration of the products. So for example, in 2019, the CDC received reports of over 199 people who were infected with salmonella, which is a type of bacterial infection in 41 different states. And through again, contact tracing, interviewing the people who were infected, they found that the use of Kratom products, a specific type of product um, was contributing because they tested the products and they found that bacteria in that as well. They've also conducted testing of different Kratom products and found high levels of lead and nickel and it's proposed that long-term exposure by use of those products can lead to heavy metal poisoning. In a different study, they found that some of the products contain a much higher level of that more potent 7-hydroxymetragenine, and it was also, also in a synthetic form. So that led the investigators to believe that a lot of the products can be manipulated and sy synthetically adulterated to get a more potent effect. So looking at the online market for Kratom, which is really huge, so I think it's important to acknowledge it. And this study investigated over 663 unique Kratom vendors online um, in English language. And they found that many of these um, online vendors that do sell products in the United States don't restrict Kratom sales to states that have prohibited and uh, made Kratom illegal. They also found that one fourth of the vendors made claims that Kratom treats opioid withdrawal and two thirds of the vendors claimed that the Kratom products were not intended for human consumption and one third claimed that their Kratom products were solely for research purposes. So again, you see that um, really important to the vendor to evade any type of liability that they may face for harm. The legal aspects related to Kratom, back in 2016, the DEA announced that it was going to pursue an emergency scheduling of Kratom to Schedule 1, which was met with widespread backlash, including from lawmakers. So they withdrew this announcement for a time of public commentary. And this topic is, topic is very controversial across the nation. And many states have moved legislation forward with making Kratom illegal in their states, as well as at the district and um, town level as well. So it is currently illegal in some states to um, possess Kratom products, but at the federal level, it's listed by the DEA currently as a drug or chemical of concern, which means it's not controlled under the Controlled Substances Act, but it can pose a risk to those who use it. At the Kentucky state level, there are currently no restrictions on Kratom products, but there was a bill proposed during the last legislative session called uh, Senate Bill 241, and that bill was really aimed at limiting the different adulteration and contamination of the products, more so than controlling the sale of the products themselves, um, but there's really been not, or there's not been any movement on that bill since that time. In conclusion, we really don't know what the role of Kratom is in the treatment of opioid use disorder. We don't have the data uh, for that at this time. But I think it's important that even though a product may be promoted as natural or safe, 
or natural or herbal does not always mean that it's completely safe and free of harm. It's important to be aware of the potential risks and the dangers of using Kratom products, especially when using them with other substances. And we still don't know how to best treat Kratom or Kratom withdrawal independence. So there are case reports of using buprenorphine products for the treatment of Kratom withdrawal independence, but that's mostly case report um, level information. And then, as we've discussed earlier, there's really a disparity in treatment and access to care for patients who have an opioid use disorder. So really, I think the interest in Kratom highlights the fact that getting care and medications that are FDA approved for the treatment of opioid use disorder is really, really important. That finishes my portion. I will now hand it off to Dr. Akinode. Well, y'all, I'm here to talk about cannabinoids. Please give me a, a little bit of leeway. I do have a three month old that really wants to talk and play right now. But um, so, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about cannabinoids? We're talking about a very large, diverse group of substances, um, all that work at the CB1 and CB2 receptors. Um, the traditional ones that we're used to are the phytocannabinoids. These are the ones that come out of the marijuana plant almost exclusively. And then we have the endocannabinoids, which are the ones we have receptors for CB1 and CB2 for a reason. We make these on our own within our body to work as a neurotransmitter. And then we have the third group that falls into these synthetic cannabinoids, the JH and JWH series. Um, you know, these exist exclusively for the fact that uh, marijuana has been schedule one, which not only means that there's not a medicinal use for it, but it prevents folks from doing research on it. So we had to create other cannabinoids to work at those CB1 and CB2 receptors to find out exactly what it is that they do and how they impact us. Uh, next slide, please. So how do they work? They're agonists at those CB1 and CB2 receptors, CB1 being found predominantly within the central nervous system uh, and the brain whereas CB2 will be found more in the peripheral nervous system. You know, this was the discovery of these receptors and exactly how they work was at one point thought to be almost Nobel Prize winning because this was the first documentation of neurotransmission moving from postsynaptic to presynaptic receptors. Um, we do know that they have varying degrees of potency. And so next slide, please. And what are the presentations that we can expect to see um, we have some common physiologic and psychological effects that come from stimulating those receptors. The main one that we see is that kind of increased reaction time or slowing of time for the part for the person who is intoxicated. We also see the time distortion and impaired short-term memory. Current theories say that it's a difficulty with actually pinning down one moment so that you can determine your overall length. Uh, euphoria and relaxation, as well as lethargy and sedation may occur. Pulmonary infiltrates are incredibly common, but more in particular, it's aspergillus that is the problem here. This is a particular fungal infection that is associated with marijuana use. Um, in overdose, we do see agitation and sometimes seizures as well as acute encephalopathy. Um, despite the euphoria and relaxation that we anticipate seeing with folks, uniformly, they are going to be tachycardic. Their heart rate is going to rise. They are going to be hypertensive and develop hypertension. Next slide. So cannabinoid testing, this is where a big question comes up is how do we test for it? So Delta 9 THC is the target substance uh, that we're looking for. And this is of course the structure over here to the right. Um, we suffer from a problem where there's a lack of a commercially available confirmatory testing for any specific uh, cannabinoid other than that of Delta THC. Um, we do get some cross-reactivity, of course, with naturally occurring cannabinoids. Delta-8 is the one that we're going to be seeing more and more of here recently. And then we know that amino acids can give us a false negative result, despite the presence of Delta-9-THC, as well as a false positive result um, in the setting of things like ibuprofen. Thank you for the next slide. And so here is just something to kind of correlate along with that. Delta-9 is the illegal substance that we know of and what we are normally testing for when we're looking for cannabinoids. And you can see here on the right is Delta-8, which is a new, let's call it substance, not quite yet of abuse, but likely will be one of abuse that is going to be more common for us here. 
The only difference between the two is this double bond location. So if you have even an advanced lab, such as ours, the one at the University of Kentucky, um, our lab, even with gas chromatography or liquid chromatography mass spec, cannot determine the difference between the two of these. Um, so it requires some pretty advanced testing and a research. Next slide, please. Regulatory status is where we're going to get run into trouble. So ultimately what it comes down to is we're trying to figure out whether Delta-8 is a legal or an illegal substance. And currently, as it is written, um, Delta-8 could be classified as a legal substance provided that it comes naturally, that it comes derived from a hemp product. Um, this can be naturally or synthetically derived from uh, any hemp product, as long as it's not being made with non-cannabis material. So any of those actual phytoestrogen, non-cannabis material, um, then it would become illegal. Um, in this case, we also have to remember that whatever product you have must contain less than 0.3% of the Delta-9 THC. Next slide, please. In this case, we also have a very interesting case that uh, Dr. Baum and I had uh, last year where we had a two-year-old girl who ingested approximately 15 milligrams per kilogram of Delta THC gummies. Um, the gummies were uh, her father's gummies and then were found out. Of course, this is a problem when dealing with cannabinoid products because a lot of them are made to look like candy and be more palatable. Ultimately, this child, um, after the parents recognized what had happened, took her into the hospital, her local emergency department. She was so encephalopathic that the provider there decided to go ahead and intubate her before transporting her to us at the University of Kentucky. What made the case interesting and, and brought it to our forefront was the call that I received as the toxicologist on call was that, you know, this was an overdose of CBD with a significantly elevated Delta 9 level. And I said, that really does not make much sense. Either it is a lot, a lot, a lot of CBD um, or it's not CBD at all. On further questioning and discussion with the family, they were able to tell us that it was in fact these Delta 8 gummies. Um, we were eventually able to get the product from them as well as samples of both urine and serum to prove that this was in fact Delta 8, not Delta 9. Next slide, please. So in conclusions for us and dealing with cannabinoids, um, it can be very difficult to distinguish different cannabinoids um, that are working at those similar same receptors um, analytically though, from that of Delta-9 and even clinically. Um, so what you can anticipate is whatever syndrome that you see typical of Delta-9 may no longer simply be marijuana use, but maybe a Delta-8, Delta-10, Delta-4, or any of these other synthetic cannabinoid use. Um, we are likely going to see an increase in the number of products, and this is likely going to lead to an increase in exposures, in particular in our pediatric patients. There is no specific antidote for the treatment of cannabinoid intoxication. Um, it's simply time, and what we in emergency medicine say is metabolism to freedom. All you need to do is to make sure to provide treatment um, with symptomatic and good supportive care, know that the idea that no one can become addicted to marijuana or THC products is quickly falling out of the window due to Delta, uh, due to higher concentrations of Delta-9 and other substances. Next slide, please. All right, so I think I'm gonna take over here. Thank you, Dr. Opanonu. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the synthetics. Uh, if you wanna roll to the next slide, you can. So when we broke this presentation down, we really debated um, how to do this and how to talk about this. And we went ahead and lumped the synthetic cathinones and synthetic cath uh, cannabinoids here together in this section for me to talk about. Admittedly, there's a lot of information here, but we lumped them together because clinically when these patients pre present, we don't really know which one it is, and they could actually really present in a very similar manner. Um, you know, so both of these agents is Dr. Kelsch alluded to earlier are, are some of the new psychoactive substances. They're largely unregulated. We uh, don't really think that there's probably a legitimate medical use at this point in time, and they probably are uh, targeted at ways to evade um, 
you know, law enforcement and, and drug testing themselves. So our synthetic cathinones, which, which a lot of people on here may sort of relate more to like our bath salts and, the, and those sorts of substances have been introduced and reintroduced in the market in, in very quick succession in efforts to dodge or hinder law enforcement officials. Um, these are cheap substitutes for our more common traditional synthetics like uh, cocaine and amphetamines. These are structurally related to, to amphetamines. Um, and the current body of knowledge for these substances is a lot of case report level data. It's a lot of poison control level data and surveys of users. And there's some flaws in this, right? It's really hard when you have that type of data as opposed to big randomized controlled studies, because really what we are relying on is users, user reporting what they actually took. Um, a lot of these substances are not accurately labeled. We don't know how much they took. We don't know if there's co-ingestions that are present um, or if there's other substances of, of abuse or um, even pharmaceuticals that are in these substances that so can sort of confound the way that these patients present. And so the synthetic ca cathinones really um, became a big public health issue and, and became um, sort of more to, more to the forefront. In 2011, when there was 35 patients uh, that were reported in an MMWR report, and so those patients had all purchased bath salts online, it ended up being a substance called MDPD, P, I'm sorry, MDPV, which is an analog of MDMA. Um, and, you know, these patients were profoundly agitated, very paranoid, and, and the effects were thought to be really quite long lasting and much longer lasting than what our amphetamines and some of our other traditional uh, stimulants had been. Interestingly, so if we flip over to synthetic cannabinoids that also kind of uh, came back into public awareness around that same time, they've actually been around for a long time. So as Peter kind of alluded to, um, you know, when they started looking at ways to manage pain for cancer and they discovered the endocannabinoid system, there was a whole range of substances that have been identified since the 1970s. Um, probably the first one came about in around 1974. Pfizer developed it. It was cyclohexaphenol. Um, but the structure of these ranges greatly. You know, as I said, with the synthetic cathinoids, those are really amphetamine-like. With the synthetic cannabinoids, these can be a really broad range uh, of substances. It's just really that they can interact with that receptor. Um, and, you know, these probably started coming to the illicit drug market in early 2000s, um, but really hit big probably around 2011 when we started seeing a lot of legislative action against these things. Um, and this is probably now one of the largest class of um, some of these new cycle or sorry, new psychoactive substances that are hitting the market. There's probably more than 300 of these uh, to date that have been identified and there's probably more to come. If you wanna to roll to the next slide, that would be fabulous. So at the end of this presentation, when I go through my section, if you get to the end and you're like, hey, look, Regan, I'm not sure what is a cathinone and I'm not sure what is a cannabinoid and I'm not sure how to tell the difference and I'm not sure how they present differently and you're a little bit confused, welcome to our party, okay? This is sort of what is happening to us clinically when these folks roll through the door. Um, you know, we'll get somebody there, maybe they were agitated, Maybe they were agitated and then found down. You know, maybe they got naloxone and maybe there was an opioid on board, maybe not, right? Very mixed ingestions, but these, these patients um, present in a similar manner and we don't really have a really good way to tell which one's which. Um, and as you can see between these two, you see that I have some pathomimetic action um, up there. So what that means, if you're not familiar with that terminology, um, so pathomimetics are stimulants, much like cocaine, much like amphetamine, much like if you or I went on a run, right? We'd see our blood pressure increase, we'd see our heart rate increase, our respiratory rate increase, we would see, you know, sweating, that sort of stuff, really characteristic of both of these um, substances. Hallucinations and psychosis um, is, is been seen, seizures have been seen, and agitation, panic attacks, you know, there, there has been obviously some... Um, other stuff beyond this, there has been organ damage. Um, you know, you can see later on in the presentation, you can see hypotension, you can see decreased level of consciousness, consciousness, all of that sort of stuff. But it's this very muddy picture clinically where um, we're relying a lot on the story from the scene and a lot on the story from the patient in order to try to figure out what's going on. And even those stories are not always reliable because people don't really know what they're getting. If you wanna to roll to the next slide, that would be great. So I'm going to start with the synthetic cathinones or the bath salts. You know, these substances are sold to the public, as Jordan mentioned, through the internet or retail establishments, head shops, all sorts of places like that. You can get them. 
Um, although most of these now are laboratory derived, the chemicals themselves are natural in origin. So it used to be um, that historical references go back, uh, you know, uh, hundreds, thousands of years to the cot shrub in, uh, that grows in Somalia, Yemen, Kenya, and Ethiopia. And, you know, these plants, the leaves were taken, they were chewed, it caused euphoria and stimulant-like effects. Um, and these uh, plants contain some of our um, older parent cathinone compounds. Um, and, you know, the earliest reports of synthesis of these products dates back to the 1820s. So they've been around for a really long time um, with uh, methacathinone in Germany. And since 2004, various substances, uh, various synthetic cathinones have been reported, um, you know, and today there's more than 30 of these that are known. And, you know, it's really hard for us to find them because a lot of our routine hospital testing, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, isn't able to detect these. Next slide. So like I said, you can see the structure of amphetamine and the structure of the cathinones over there. These are very, very similar to amphetamine. They have effects very much like amphetamine. So they have effects on dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. And depending on what we do, if you see the R groups on that bottom structure, depending on what we hang off there, it can kind of depend how it hits different um, receptors in the body. And we can kind of make, if we have a structure and we have a compound, we can kind of make some guesses at what we think it's going to do. Um, and the reason why it's important when we think about how it affects those different systems is, you know, if it affects the dopamine system, really what we see uh, in more dopaminergic agents is we can see increase in repetitive dosing as part of that um, process that happens. So, you know, if you remember back to like, I don't know if you remember this, but college, college psychology with the mouse getting the cocaine and it would rather take more hits of cocaine than go and eat and drink, right? So that's, that's the dopamine system doing that, right? So, you know, although some of these substances may not be as long lasting as like an amphetamine or cocaine, if you start taking a whole bunch of it and you have that dopamine release in your brain where you're wanting more and it's causing this repetitive dosing, we can see marked changes in that. We can see these things stick around longer. Can also lead to some more of the psychotic effects of these agents. So, you know, agents that are more dopaminergic in action, we can think about those being a bigger problem. Norepinephrine um, is sort of a cousin of epinephrine. And for you guys that aren't familiar with that as a catecholamine, it's kind of like adrenaline, if you think about adrenaline. So it can cause some of those sympathomimetic effects that, that I talked about in the clinical presentation. Um, serotonin has really been li linked a lot to the hallucinogenic type components of this. So, you know, every single one of these cathinones has a little bit different structure. They can affect these, um, these endogenous catecholamines a little bit different. There's not a whole lot of human um, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic data that tells us a whole lot about like, what does this drug do to the human body? What does the human body do to this drug? Um, and what we have is largely animal-based right now. Um, and, you know, even the stuff that we do have out there is sometimes confounded by other stuff that's in the substance. And we don't, we don't always know a whole lot about what we're dealing with. And so it's really, really hard to generalize the findings from these studies um, just because of the varying experimental models and, and the various uh, cathinones being studied. Next slide. So regulatory status, um, you know, these are, are evolving new substances in late uh, 2011, the DEA put an emergency ban out to, to ban three of the more common cathinones. In 2012, uh, President Obama added the uh, um, fedronone and MDPD to the list, as long as as well as a couple of the synthetic mm -hmm. marijuanas, um, so K2 and Spice. If you guys kind of remember those old parrot compounds, we'll talk about them in a minute. Um, so there's been a lot of action, even in 2017, 2018, to try to ban these and make them Schedule One substances. So, you know, if you guys aren't familiar with that terminology, just remembering that Schedule One substances are drugs that are thought to have very high potential for abuse and probably not any accepted medical use um, and, and questionable safety. So, you know, when we think about accepted medical use, we're thinking about a drug that's chemistry is reproducible. You know, we can anticipate what it's going to do. We know that there's adequate safety around it. We know that there's been some well-controlled studies. Um, the drug's use has been accepted by experts in the field, and there's scientific evidence widely available. And, and for this set of compounds, largely, there's just not enough out there to, to be able to do that. So a lot of these things are getting uh, classified as Schedule One substances. Next slide. So switching over now to the synthetic cannabinoids or synthetic marijuana, spice and K2 were some of the older ones that you guys are probably familiar with. Those were those were the 
some of the original players on the field. But the word cannabinoid, just remembering, is basically every chemical substance is very diverse as long as it will react with that receptor. Um, so, you know, this is really the largest class of these new psychoactive substances uh, currently out there on the market. Um, in general, these things are sold as very brightly colored products, uh, you know, they're, they're usually um, can be liquid sprayed onto something using these cigarettes, vaped, um, all sorts of all sorts of methods. Next slide. So the structure is really quite diverse. Um, I put that's marijuana on the right hand side, THC marijuana. Um, you know, from a chemical point of view, these are really not structurally related to the classical cannabinoids. They do tend to have this four component. Um, structural element with a core, uh, a link, a ring, and a tail, um, you know, but not all of them do, but they are, uh, I put that up there just so you can see that these are really quite different from, um, from the marijuana compound itself. Next slide. Regulatory status, so somewhat similar to the cathinones, you know, a lot of these have been banned and started being banned a lot in 2010. These don't fall under the hemp bill or the farm bill or any of that sort of stuff because these are strictly lab derived, right? These are not from a plant in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, prior to 2010, these were not controlled substances. And with the identification of the JWH products that Peter alluded to earlier, you know, as a way, you know, those were developed as a way to, you know, try to study um, some of these synthetic cannabinoids. Um, you know, so these have been uh, slowly listed as Schedule One substances, um, and currently, you know, there's a, around 220. I think there's a little bit more than that. 220 substances that are listed as Schedule One substances. 43 of those are actually uh, synthetic cannabinoids right now. Next slide. Uh, I think one more slide. Sorry, I think I was talking without asking you to progress. So these do have action at the CB1 and CB2 receptors, right? But they're probably a lot more potent than THC. And part of it is because, you know, when you think about marijuana that's derived from the hemp plant, um, the cannabinoids in that plant have both agonist and antagonist properties. So um, what that means is if you think about like opioids, for instance, so if you have heroin, that's the agonist at the opioid receptor, you have naloxone, that's the antagonist at that receptor, right? So in the, in the marijuana plant, you have both things. You have an agonist, right? Something that hits the receptor, causes an action, and you have antagonist, something that blocks the action, right? In these synthetic cannabinoids, we don't have that. We just have agonists. So we don't really have anything there that's going to kind of um, blunt some of those responses. So we do get uh, a lot more potency. We do get a lot more effectiveness. Um, and depending on which um, structure it is and that sort of stuff, you can have um, you know, several times higher potency, several times higher effects. Um, you can have longer half-lives. Um, you know, so... And then you also have to think about active metabolites as these, uh, of these substances. So, you know, as these substances are uh, taken into our body, our body has ways that it metabolizes it and breaks it down in an effort to eliminate these things from the body. And sometimes when it does that, it has uh, metabolites are created and some of those metabolites can have actions as well. Um, you know, and then also we have to think about like other substances that are also in these substances that are not cannabinoids, right? So um, almost nothing anymore is single substance. Next slide. So synthetics in general, I'm swooping back and I'm gonna talk about these both group generally now again at this point in time, because I told you the presentation is similar. The management in these in the ER is similar to, we don't have an antidote, right? We don't have something that directly reverses the action of these things. Um, and treatment really largely becomes symptomatic and supportive care, you know, um, very similar to what amphetamines would be, very similar to what cocaine would be, um, very similar to what some of our other um, hallucinogens and psychoactive substances would be. So we do a lot of symptomatic and supportive care. Next slide. So the testing, um, you know, we are very limited in the clinical setting right now with the testing that we have in being able to um, know what we're dealing with. Um, you know, routine testing for both of these agents is very limited. You know, any of the immunoassays that are out there, the common testing um, that is 
sort of readily available. There's not a lot of cross reactivity with similar substances. So the cathinones don't have cross reactivity in general to our amphetamines or methamphetamine tests. Um, and the cannabinoids, as I said, are just such a broad, um, a broad swath of structures that they don't cross react with THC. So it makes it really hard. Um, you know, you can send these things out to labs and they can break it down and identify them. But a lot of times our hospital have, have a lot of limitations in what they can actually identify. Hold well, on the next slide, if you would, please. Um, so this is um, the cathinones in general. So this is a list of the cathinones uh, that our hospital can send out and test for right now. So at UK, um, we can send out and we can test for the substances that are listed there. But, you know, as Jordan alluded to, as I hopefully alluded to, and, and you will understand at the end of this presentation, you know, these chemical entities are changing all the time in a way to um, evade law enforcement, right? So, um, you know, how relevant the ones that are up there that we are able to test for now is probably really questionable. I will tell you, you know, Peter and I, as part of other research, have been looking at this and trying to identify some novel agents. And there's a maybe two on this list that I've seen when we've sent out uh, in collaboration with like the DEA Tox Lab in California to identify stuff. Um, there's maybe two on this list that I've seen and the rest of these I'm, I'm not seeing, which leads me to believe that, you know, they probably are no longer out there. We're dealing with other stuff. So, um, and then to compound this, uh, we get the samples, we have the patient in the ED, you know, a lot of times these people, hopefully, if they're not a severe overdose, they're not going to be staying in our hospital for days and days. A lot of times these people come in for, you know, less than a day sometimes. Um, but, you know, the send out testing takes five to 11 days to come back. And so it really doesn't have a whole lot of barrier or a whole lot of impact on um, our clinical management, unfortunately. Next slide. Same story with the cannabinoids. Um, you know, this is the list of cannabinoids that, that we can send out with now. Okay. Um, and you notice the turnaround time is still really quite limited. So it just leaves us um, lacking. Next slide. You know, and, and sometimes it's the adulterants in the product that can become the problem. So this is an MMWR report um, from 2018. Uh, and this is our synthetic um, cannabinoids that were adulterated with a, a substance called uh, brofraconium. And this is actually, if you want to scroll to the next page or the next slide, this is um, a super warfarin. So this works like warfarin or coumadin. If you've ever heard of that, it's a very potent blood thinner. The difference between it and warfarin is it stays in your system for months and months and requires a lot more of the anecdotal therapy that we have for that agent. Um, and so there was actually several, um, I think that report was from Indiana. There was actually three patients in our um, to our south in Tennessee uh, that were noted to, to have seen patients that were um, that saw this um, contaminated as part of the process or as part of their um, uh, clinical presentation. So it's kind of interesting. Next slide. We're not alone here in Kentucky. Uh, so this is actually a synthetic uh, cannabinoid that we've seen here uh, since we've been starting to look for some of these new novel substances. So we had seven, seven patients that have been identified with this ADB budinaca. Um, Six of them were identified in June. One of them um, actually hit again the same the same chemical structure again in November. Um, you know, for the most part, uh, all of these patients didn't just test positive for this. Almost all of them tested positive for somewhere between three and six other substances as well. Um, some of them were pharmaceutical substances. Some of them were um, like more illicit type substances. Um, most of them in the report, when you would get it, is there would be this initial uh, agitation followed by a decreased responsiveness. Um, you know, almost all of the patients got naloxone, had no response to naloxone. Um, there was some element of hypotension that, that happened with these patients and they landed in our EDs. And most of these patients had, um, you know, some more prolonged stays, several of them landed in the ICU. So, you know, these things are out there and in our backyards and, and we're seeing them now and trying to manage these patients with, um, with the resources that we have. Next slide. So from the synthetic standpoint, what I hope that you take from this is that, you know, these products are ever changing. We have very mixed chemical picture, clinical pictures. We really don't know what we're dealing with. And we are using a lot of symptomatic and supportive care to manage these patients uh, on a shift basis uh, as we don't have a direct antidote. 
Next slide. All right, so I get to do the wrap up. That's kind of where we are. And, and I think we, I, I guess we'll see how we are with uh, finishing everything for questions, but we'll certainly ask, answer any questions that we can answer in, in during the question session um, in the next couple of weeks. But, you know, head shops right now are, are really evolving. The substances that are available to the public are really evolving. What's available online is very much evolving. Um, you know, what I hope that you understand is some of the limitations that we're hitting with um, caring for these patients, um, knowing what sort of substances are out there. Uh, research is really difficult to conduct and, and is really largely lacking. And right now we don't really have any treatments. And so the treatment is really, or any antidotes to the treatment really becomes symptomatic and supportive care. And so at this point in time, I'll turn it back over to John and, and thank everybody for coming today. Thank you all so much for uh, your presentation. Um, we do have uh, time for questions. So if it's a, a longer question, what we can do is I will allow the, the speakers can definitely say, you know what, let's do that next week. Um, but uh, first we did, I personally have like a bunch of questions just because uh, I don't know anything about this and it's so uh, interesting. Uh, but one question is, uh, someone said that Delta-8 nine and 10 are sold in gas stations. So what's the difference between these things? Because from, I mean, from the picture you, you showed, it looked very similar. So I like Yeah, that. the if, if you can actually go back to my slide, the difference is, you know, literally that of one that requires a chemist to actually tell the difference between. So again, here on the left is the Delta nine, on the right is Delta-8. And if you come to this kind of circular, I don't know if you probably can't see my mouse, but <laughs> uh, there is a double bond in the top left ring and that is demarcated by two lines. That is what makes it Delta-9. And if you move over to Delta-8, that double bond has moved. It has literally just moved over between two different atoms, but still on the top of the ring. Nope, further up. That one right there. That versus where it is on the image on the left is the difference between the two. Um, and then the same is true for Delta 10. You're simply just moving that double bond around the ring. What this results in is varying levels of potency, or at least what we believe to be potency. This is kind of a, let's say we're a little naive in terms of what the actual actions of the difference between Delta-8, Delta-9, and Delta-10 are, simply because we haven't been able to do research on them. And we know that Delta-9 has been the predominant THC, the predominant cannabinoid, leading to the belief that it's providing most of the action and symptoms that we see in our patients. Um, from the more difficult standpoint, Delta-9 is illegal. Down. The Delta-8 and the Delta-10, depending on how they're derived, may not be illegal. So to, to follow up on that question, just so to, I don't know if this makes it more complicated, but when you talk about like uh, medical marijuana, what is, it, how does that, is there like, is that part of the compound in there that makes it medicinal or I, I don't know how to ask this question, but I know. <laughs> So in dealing with like, let's say states that have legalized recreational or medicinal marijuana products, one, we have to remember that according to the federal government, marijuana, Delta 9 is all illegal. Um, the states have said, you know, we are decriminalizing this. So the state really will not pursue action in this regard. And the general stance from the DEA has been watchful waiting. There's nothing that stops the DEA from coming into a state with, you know, legalized marijuana products and arresting every person that has purchased them and they find in possession of them. But also then from a manpower standpoint, not really worth the effort. Um, so in dealing with the medicinal products, you're allowed to have that Delta 9 content, at least for the state rules and the state law, this is no longer considered to be illegal. Well, it still will remain at the federal law. 
Um, in dealing with the medicinal products, you're thinking of like dronabinol and these other medications that we have that are specifically designed to work similarly to marijuana. Those are not Delta-8 products, but rather products that are similar, similar to the way we discussed kind of the JWH products that act at the same receptor. Okay, I think that makes sense. Uh, I appreciate it. And so when thinking about the difference between uh, marijuana and hemp, is it this thing that we circled that makes it different? So the difference between marijuana and hemp largely in the law is going to be related to the Delta-9 content of the product and your intention for use. So hemp being an outstanding natural fiber, what you are hoping to do with it, make rope, make clothing, other things um, is the goal. But the overall Delta-9 content um, for it to be hemp has to be less than the 0.3%. If it's more than that, then we don't, then it is not considered to be a hemp product. Got it. Thank you. It is the same plant though. Thank you, uh, Dr. Oler. Um, does anybody else have any questions? So I'll just kind of leave it open. You can put it in the chat or if you feel comfortable, you can just uh, unmute yourself uh, or raise your hand and uh, I'll call on you. I just have a question. Um, while we're talking about the hemp, I was told, you know, like, because, you know, I've been trying to research this too and, you know, talking to people that are actively using and things. And, you know, somebody had told me that the, the difference, because it comes from the same plant while growing. And it was a lighting situation. So depending on the light. So I was just wondering if it is a chemical that's added or if it is the light that changes that or makes that hemp or legal or illegal. Am I making sense? I'm sorry. <laughs> so in, in terms of the plant, it is the THC content that comes out that is what determines this to be legal or illegal. And so there are multiple factors that can go into changing the THC content of whatever plant that you may have. Um, thinking about similar to what we do in agriculture to try and grow larger amounts of corn or wheat, or to increase yield from soybeans, we will breed multiple strains together to get a better product. Um, along that same line, the same can be done for cannabis products. I can breed multiple different types of, or say cultivar, multiple different types of cannabis together to increase the THC content that I want, or to decrease the THC content that I want. I can adjust aspects of the environment that may also play a role in this regard. And so then the ultimate product that comes out with the total THC content of that particular portion of the plant that you were using or the plant as a whole is what determines whether it is hemp or not. Thank you. Um, so I'll say we'll have, uh, if there's if one more question, otherwise I will go through the, okay, yep. So we got one more question and then, uh, and then I'll go through the stuff. And then if anyone else has any questions, I'll have links and stuff to, to submit those. So the, the next question is, do Delta-8 and Delta-10 appear on urine drug screens? Uh, I have patients say that they use these products from head shops because they won't be detected on a drug test. But in the case with the two-year-old, it was detected as Delta-9. So... As a result of your drug testing, you're not going to get the answer that you are positive for Delta-8 or Delta-10. However, um, depending on the test that is being utilized, more than likely it will show up as Delta-9. So interestingly enough, the product that we took in our two-year-old's case actually has a warning on it that you will test positive for marijuana on your drug screen. Um, again, the difference here is the position of a double bond which for most uh, laboratories is not a sufficient enough difference to decide that it's one product or another. So if it's simply the position of the double bond, um, Delta-8 will show up as Delta-9. Delta-10 will show up as Delta-9 as well. Thank you for that response. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and, and I just want to, again, uh, 
And so I guess there was a comment that the, the older K2 and spice products didn't show up on the test. So those are different than Delta 8 and 9, correct? <laughs> Those are, right? So those are the synthetic ones. Um, so structurally, they actually look really quite a bit different. Um, and so a lot of times there's not cross-reactivity with some of the um, THC type assays. Um, and they are a little bit harder to detect. You know, I kind of showed you the ones that UK is able to detect now. A lot of those are older. Um, but in order to detect those, you have to have the way that we have them, you have to have a library where, the, where you have a known substance that your lab can kind of look at the substance, go through and kind of do all the QA, QI to be sure that they're actually positively identifying it. And the thing is, these, these structures are changing so much and so fast that a lot of times we don't have time to update our libraries in a timely manner. And so the times, like when I cited that, that case that I cited at the end of my presentation where we did catch that substance, that was actually done by our colleagues out at the DEA Talks Lab in California. Okay, so that was not testing that was able to be done here at UK. Um, and it's, it's just because of how quickly these things are changing and how expensive it is to update our libraries. We probably have the capabilities to identify some of these substances, but it's, um, it's a resource and library limitation, if that makes sense. But the cross reactivity with the, with the marijuana testing is um, almost done, if none. <laughs>